Funding for Art Loft is made possible by Friends of Art, Friends of South Florida PBS, the Josephine S. Lizer Foundation, and Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. This project is sponsored in part by the State of Florida, Department of State, Division of Cultural Affairs, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture. Hi, I'm Jamani Anambi, and from the Norton Museum of Art in West Palm Beach, this, this right here, this is Art Law. here at the Norton Museum of Art and I have the pleasure of speaking with the assistant curator Rachel Gustafson. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. All for right, thank, out. thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So uh, there's so much going on here. Sure I don't do. even know where to start. <laughs> but first let's start about this new project. What are you guys doing with this? The new Norton it is? The new Norton, that's right. right. That's what we were calling it kind of internally and it's grown into uh, the way we describe this exciting project that's happening, which really if you take it down to the minimum, it's a hundred million dollar project and it's uh, led by Pritzker Prize winning architect Lord Norman Foster in London. So this is um, not only an architectural endeavor, but one that we really hope brings in a wider audience from West Palm Beach and beyond. So it's a really exciting time to, to have you here and talk about the museum's well, future. Of course you're here to stay but you really are making sure you're always going to have interesting pieces for the community because you're really an important part of this uh, community out here, right? Oh, yeah. The, the museum. I mean, as the Norton's uh, concerned, and I think our vision for the future is this, we hope that this new building and the art that's within it, obviously, is a huge part of that, will really transform South Florida's cultural landscape. I think when we look at the, um, the origins of this museum, Ralph Norton founded it in 1941. He's a Chicago steel industrialist. The founding objects at the Norton were just over 300 works from the Norton's personal collection. And so now we're really building off of that um, that heritage that he started uh, with the Gannicks donating their new works and then the other works that are coming into the collection from other really important um, local donors and, and even outside of the state of Florida. Okay, so you have this beautiful museum founded with all these beautiful pieces, <laughs> continue to be donated. You have this hundred million dollar project. Yes. So, okay, so what are you going to do? What are the new things that are going to be happening in the museum? One of the, the, the more important things to, to, I think, keep in mind is that we've expanded our gallery space by 37%. So that means more exhibitions. Our education space is expanded by 50%. We can create programming in a way we've really never been able to do before. We'll have a brand new auditorium for lectures uh, from artists or critics or scholars. So really the, the programming possibilities are kind of endless. Right. Yeah. As I was walking through the museum, I did see a piece that was really interesting. I mean, I'll do it in layman's terms. It was just a car, a okay. pink car. That's right. Tell me about that. <laughs> All right, so that is Sylvie Fleury's work. She's a Swiss artist. Um, and that work that you're describing is actually a crushed Toyota Tercel. And it's covered in pink nail polish. It, it's speaking to almost um, feminist values for sure. We're able to showcase things like that, the art of yesterday compared to the art of today. So, so you really have the whole spectrum of years. It's not just contemporary works and modern work. I mean, you, you really have everything here. I believe so. I mean, we have Neolithic Stone Age objects right. compared to something like the work that's behind us by yeah, Michelin right. Thomas. Right. That's really cool to be able to see both of these things in one museum. Right. Okay. It is a rare thing, I think, yeah. in South Florida to see this kind of uh, swath of time within one collection. Right. Well, this is great. I'm, like, excited. I'm excited. You guys are awesome. It's a pleasure. Yeah, Thank I'm you for coming. I'm looking forward to the new building. I love this space we're in now. And um, yeah, this is going to be an exciting time for the Norton. I think so as well. English photographer Rachel Brown turns her lens on South Florida as the artist in residence at the Palm Beach Photographic Center. Now, the resulting body of work reveals our particular fascination with entertainment. Check it out. At nighttime, reality becomes somewhat different. It suddenly gets a certain sense of strangeness. 
to what it would have during the daytime. My name is Rachel Louise Brown and I am uh, an artist um, that primarily uses photography to capture the things that I am interested in. My residency at the Palm Beach Photographic Centre has been going for four years now. The name of the show is Simulations. I came to Florida and I applied for the residency because I was really interested in how Florida is advertised to Europe and the United Kingdom as being a place of entertainment and escapism and a sort of kind of thrill-seeking place for people that want to escape reality. Throughout my um, career as an artist, I, since leaving education, since leaving my masters, I have consistently done residencies because they've given me the space to explore something that's unfamiliar to me. The residency gives me an access to a place and to locals that I wouldn't get if I just kind of turned up with my camera. The first year I did my usual process which is wandering around at night time with my big medium format film camera. So I have a process of doing that to kind of get to grips with the place. I always do a self-portrait where you wouldn't know it was me but I become a character within a space. I went to the Breakers Hotel and they allowed me to shoot in two of their ballrooms and I run out into the space and I just dance or I play. So what you get, because it's a long exposure, is this ghostly figure moving through the space and there's one in particular that really worked well. Within the show there was the gymnasts and the, and the marching bands and the ballerinas which was a sort of kind of detour from where I began with the nighttime explorations but when you go to the show and you walk around you can see the evolution of the work and it began with these nighttime explorations it then moved on to niche entertainment places and then eventually I thought to myself what about people who actually train to entertain so you know these young teenagers who are spending a lot of time to perform for the you know the entertainment of others to become a, vis a visual spectacle so that's when I started to look at the ballerinas and the marching bands which we don't have in the UK so I've always been quite fascinated with the uniforms are so beautiful in a similar way to the simulated environments and the people who performed that responded to the casting call the ballerinas the marching bands they are the kind of end point I think where the exploration was about people who actually perform and become a simulated character rather than an environment, so it kind of went full circle. Up next we present the short film Havana House, which traces the life story of Josie Alonzo. Now on the eve of the Cuban Revolution, Alonzo was a young newlywed moving into her in-law stately home. Five decades later, she continues caring for the home she built with her husband. You do not want to miss this tender portrait from filmmaker Gaspar Gonzalez. Realmente, mi nombre es Josefina Granda, pero todo el mundo decía la casa de Alonso, la casa de Alonso, y como me decían Josie, pues con el tiempo fue Josie Alonso, la señora de Miguel Alonso. El velado era muy bonito, muy lindo. Todo el mundo frecuentábamos los mismos clubs, los mismos colegios. La única familia de aquella época que queda soy realmente yo sola. Hoy en día la última que queda aquí soy yo.
mi esposo Miguel, él siempre tenía esto como lo... Parece ser que como él nació en esta casa, pues él lo tenía como lo más grande, ¿no? Eh, para él era su patrimonio, su todo. Miguel y yo nos casamos en el 9 de noviembre del año 58. Eh, había una situación muy difícil, porque estaba, imagínense, ya lo, al, era en diciembre fue el problema de la revolución y todo eso. Después de la revolución, muchas personas se fueron por los negocios, etc. Que hubo una etapa en que fueron nacionalizando poco a poco. Algunos se quedaron, porque eran mayores, y los jóvenes se iban. Y entonces los mayores se quedaban, porque que, querían ver qué pasaba, si podían recuperar algo. En esta casa estaba viviendo mi suegro con mi cuñada, la que era la soltera, la, una de las mayores. Y al morir los dos, la casa quedaba al garete, y por eso vinimos para esta casa en el año 63, cuando toda la familia se fue y ellos murieron. Esta foto es de mi esposo Miguel jugando golf en el club inglés. Él era muy buen golfista, la de realidad. Y él fue prácticamente, por supuesto, el que me enseñó a mí. Me da mucha tristeza porque él le encantaba el golf. Y él decía, bueno, aunque yo sea muy viejo, voy a poder seguir jugando golf. Como él era azucarero, el ingeniero azucarero, pues tuvo algunas clases que dar y esta fue una de las fotos en la que él estaba dando clases. A mí me enseñaron, cuando yo era jovencita, que el dueño de la casa, el dueño de la casa, era el dueño de la casa. Y yo, cuando Miguel decía una cosa, mi esposo decía, es por aquí, a veces ni me consultaba. Él se quedó en Cuba porque él quiso quedarse en Cuba. Nadie lo obligó a quedarse. Porque para él pensó que este era su patrimonio y como no habíamos tenido familia, él dijo, podemos sostenernos y podemos... Me... ¿Cómo a... aguantar todas las cosas que nos puedan suceder? Que nos sucedieron bastante. Miguel murió el 29 de noviembre de 2012. Él no comprendía que tenía que ir al cardiólogo. Él creía que era el asma y no era el asma ya. Ya era el corazón que lo estaba... Porque inclusive allí me lo dijeron. ¿Por qué me lo trajo tan tarde? Porque ya llegó que no podía, no podía. Al morir él, sinceramente, sentí un vacío muy grande. Y muchas veces, muchas veces, yo me siento y me pongo a pensar. Y yo digo, ay, Miguel, ¿por qué tú me has dejado sola? Y parece mentira que muchas veces que yo hago esto y me doy cuenta enseguida lo que él quería o lo que él quisiera que yo hiciera. Porque lo que yo creo es, sencillamente, y es verdad, que él está aquí adentro. 
Es más, él me dejó una carta eh, que la escribió antes de morir, no una carta, es decir, unas instrucciones de lo que yo debía hacer con esto, con lo otro y con las cosas de la casa, más o menos. Y al final me pone, yo siempre te he querido mucho. Y vaya. Yo tuve un planificado hace dos años, va a ser dos años ahora, irme a Estados Unidos. Pero tuve que desistir porque era un mes que tenía que dejar la casa sola, no sola exactamente, sino con una, un par de amigos que no, yo no estaba muy segura de cómo iba a ser la cosa. Y era una fecha muy mala porque era del de, mes de diciembre completo a pasar la, Que yo quería ir para ver a la familia, que no los veía hacía tantísimos años, desde el año sesenta y pico. Pero dije, bueno, no. Y entonces un amigo mío, al cabo del tiempo, vino y me dijo, yo, si tú sabes lo que te pasa a ti, que estas casas son anclas. Que tú las disfrutas, pero son anclas. Yo soy dueña de la casa, pero yo siempre digo que por accidente, porque me casé con mi esposo, porque me casé con Miguel. Pero yo nunca, jamás en mi vida, nunca, nunca pensé ser dueña de esta casa. En mi mente nunca pasó, jamás. Para mí eso nunca existió. Y que esta casa me pertenezca, para mí ha sido como, no sé qué decirle. Por lo tanto, me duele mucho. Tengo una idea absurda totalmente, absurda, pero pienso que si yo la dejo, lo estoy traicionando a él. Cosa estúpida, porque sinceramente no es realidad, porque la vida va cambiando y la voy a tener que dejar. Ya que me muera, la tengo que dejar. Pero me pongo a pensar lo que él la quería y lo que él trataba de mantenerla con mucho problema económico. Pero tratamos de mantenerla. Por lo tanto, eso es una cosa que me, me llega mucho. Me llega mucho. Yo me siento muy feliz cuando estoy aquí, porque tengo tantos recuerdos, todo lo que veo me acuerdo de todo. Y por eso pienso mucho en la casa y lo que pueda suceder, lo que yo pueda hacer, porque eso me da mucha tristeza que pueda destruirse. Quisiera que se mantuviera. Miami-based artist Anastasia Samolova is on the hunt for landscapes. Now, from deserts to glaciers to storms and so on, she creates 3D studio sculptures, which she then photographs. So she takes a sculpture and then photographs it. It's a constant shift between dimensions. Let's hear more about her innovative approach to landscapes. constantly inundated by images so we are we sort of take them for granted now and those numbers no longer shock anybody it's just sort of in our collective memory and collective psyche now it's so easy now to share an image with the world that it's being done in huge numbers and I'm interested in that phenomenon of contemporary culture the idea of sharing and that exchange of information in visual form The idea of landscape sublime, the sublime part comes not necessarily from the sublime in the landscape, but the sublime in the sort of the number of images shared with each other of something picturesque and beautiful. I look right past the screen of the computer into a three-dimensional world. 
And then when I print them out, it becomes a two-dimensional picture with finite, small you know, edges. It's a rectangle. So I want to recreate that feeling of a vast landscape of a three-dimensional environment. So I sculpt the images into a tableau that create that sort of simulated environment. And then I flatten them out again through re-photographing and printing out that environment. The work, in fact, is physically constructed and shot with camera and not manipulated. So all the layers that you see that look like they have been made in Photoshop are actual physical things that are in the space. I tend to add elements absolutely everywhere. And when I start seeing on my camera screen, and I purposely don't use my laptop uh, for a bigger picture, I want to judge the composition on a small LCD screen of my camera. Otherwise, I get way too distracted. Then when it's just too much, I have to stop. So with this work, I, I try not to be very dictatorial in terms of the meaning of the work. Um, on the one hand, it's all brought out to the surface. Um, things like, you know, the seductive qualities of photography, the light, the color, the composition. So in one way, I want the viewer to be seduced by that. And on the other hand, you know, there are levels and um, layers that would be individual to whoever looks at the work. Anastasia's work has a really interesting social component to it. You forget that she's spending all of this time on the internet mining through lots and lots of images. Those images come from images that are offered by the general public for use by anybody. So there's a real relationship that builds up in the works between her and the people whose work she's plucking off the internet. But somehow they all come together to create these really complex, interesting photographs. Straight out of college, I got a job decorating windows for a designer brand back in Moscow. So these were storefront windows, and it's a finite space. And it's very restricted parameters that I would have to change up bi-weekly. And so this teaches you a lot about composition, having to work within such limited parameters. I have a piece called Glaciers. I've never seen a glacier yet in my life, but I can picture how it would look like based on the images that I have seen. And I wanted to sort of create a visual metaphor for this idea of if an imagined space. So I would literally reassemble an environment, a three-dimensional environment out of those pictures that planted this imaginary scene in my mind. Something I've never seen before in photography is Anastasia's work goes from two-dimensional, where she's mining these flat images off of the internet, to three-dimensional, where she creates these tabletop tableaus, and then she re-photographs them to become two-dimensional again. 2D to 3D to 2D. You don't see that very often in contemporary photography. I don't think that proliferation can be stopped in any way. So I'm, I'm playing with it, I'm sort of embracing it and um, trying to make sense of it. The work is really my thought process about um, this image exchange that's happening. So I live now in Miami Beach and between the ocean and the creek. And this new series is, is really made in response to my new environment. I feel like a flood zone is informed by Landscape Sublime. It wouldn't have existed without Landscape Sublime. It is almost like I'm living out one of my Landscape Sublime tableaus. Um, I'm actually surrounded by pictures constantly. The seductiveness of, of the light in Miami Beach, it's like I don't have to invent light anymore. It already exists here and it reflects off of the multitude of, of shiny surfaces in Miami. It is sort of this jungle, but it's so unnatural already and it's so there's plenty of artifice for me to work with that I'm absolutely fascinated with. 
what are the odds for me to <laughs> to move to <laughs> to Miami Beach, which is just the embodiment of that constructed environment? Thanks for joining us on this episode of Art Loft. Find us on social media at Art Loft SFL, where you can connect with us anytime. For Art Loft, I'm Jamani Anami. Now remember, art imitates life, so do what? Live a beautiful life. Peace. Funding for Art Loft is made possible by Friends of Art, Friends of South Florida PBS, the Josephine S. Lizer Foundation, and Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. This project is sponsored in part by the state of Florida, Department of State, Division of Cultural Affairs, and the Florida Council on Arts and Culture.